I've talked about the views of Hans Georg Gadamer, that ethics rests on hermeneutics, basically a way of trying to come to an interpretation and understanding of, in a way, understanding itself, but also in particular of what to do, what to be, how to decide, basic questions of ethics. He says we do that by conversation. And the norms of those conversations, which Habermas would say are really fundamental and presupposed by any kind of conversation, Gadamer would say are part of the context of a particular dialogue, discussion, conversation itself. There is no presupposition-free position from which we can say, here are the rational norms governing any reasonable conversation. Instead, we have to negotiate those as we go. And so ethics is the record of those kinds of reflections, those kinds of dialogues, discussions, deliberations, and conversations about what to be, what to do, and how to decide. I want to talk about a contrast today that's a little bit different. The criticisms toward Gadamer's view advanced by Jacques Derrida. Derrida as we'll see, thinks that Gadamer's goal is itself far too ambitious. So you might say Gadamer looks at Habermas and his idea that there are certain presupposition-free norms for any rational dialogue. He says that's far too optimistic, that's too ambitious. Instead, this is something that has to evolve out of particular conversations, in particular contexts with particular participants, and a particular set of goals, with a particular history. Derrida says, I think you're being too optimistic. You're being too ambitious. We can't actually do that. Gadamer, after all, is asking the question, does conversation presuppose any norms at all? And he says, well, yes. Productive dialogue does require some degree of sincerity, goodwill, and open-mindedness, but the form those things take can't be given from on high, abstractly, from nowhere. Instead, we evolve those and sometimes suspend them in particular conversations. In that fiction competition, we suspend questions of sincerity. We suspend factual representation. On the other hand, do we suspend goodwill? Do we suspend sincerity? Actually, trying to participate in this attempt to write fiction, for example, if somebody simply comes in and presents something that would simply be absurd as a work of fiction, we might think, well, that, that's not help. That's not part of what we do here. You know, if somebody simply, for example, uh, instead of entering a poem or a short story or whatever it is we're writing in this little club to try to refine our writing ability, comes in and just simply says, look at my eyeglasses. Cool, huh? <laughs> you might say, well, that's not a work of fiction. What are you doing? Or if they simply stand in front when they're supposed to recite what they've written and just turn around and face the wall and remain silent. I mean, we might think it's an interesting Zen-like performance, or we might think, well, this is just not cooperative. You're not sincere. You're not trying to actually participate in the club. We've got to presuppose some degree of sincerity, of goodwill, of open-mindedness, even if there's no particular norm that we view as non-negotiable, that we view as something just given from abstraction, what counts as sincere behavior, what counts as goodwill, what counts as open-mindedness, may vary with the context, with the history, with the participants and their goals. But still, it seems like those are in some ways presupposed. So if there aren't particular goals that are being presupposed, or particular norms, at least there may be particular attitudes, he's admitting, that are actually presupposed. So. Does conversation presuppose any norms at all? Well, it does require these attitudes of sincerity, goodwill, open-mindedness. It's weaker than Habermas's idea that they've got to be sincere, socially appropriate or right, and factually true. But on the other hand, you can see that there is a kind of similarity of structure, not only in the sincerity and the goodwill part with the social appropriateness, but also open-mindedness being connected in some way, not exactly to factual truth or representational adequacy, but at least suggesting a willingness to listen and try to understand. Now Derrida does not attack from Habermas's direction to say, wait a minute, there are presupposition-free norms then, like be open-minded, or be willing to actually try to understand, etc. Instead, Derrida says, not only that these are themselves norms, now I don't think Gadamer really would deny that, but also that they're unattainable. Kant has a basic principle. Ought implies can. We can't really put on you 
moral requirements that you cannot meet. And Derrida says, I think the requirements, even the very weak attitudinal requirements of Gadamer, are things that cannot be met. They cannot be attained. We can't actually satisfy ourselves that our participants are sincere, that they are open-minded, that they are actually people of goodwill. Now, why? Well, Derrida doubts the project of hermeneutics itself. He says, I don't think it's possible to succeed, and no, I've succeeded in interpreting somebody else. I'm not sure ever that I've understood someone. That requires me to have a way of understanding and interpreting meaning. And he says, I don't think it can be done. We can never know what the other person means. Our own participation is never fully open-minded. We all come at a certain conversation, a dialogue, not only with particular individual goals, but particular individual histories and ways of understanding. And there is no way we can fully understand any of the other participants at all. Now, there are certain background beliefs and assumptions that, look, no matter what, we would not be willing to surrender. At least in that context, we're not going to reconsider them. We're not going to surrender them. And that suggests that this kind of mutual project of understanding, of cooperation in this context of dialogue, may be misconceived from the start. Maybe it is simply impossible to attain. Well, Godover responds. He says that conversation allows us to ask what somebody means. We can ask them whether we understand it correctly. In other ways, we can improve our understanding of what they mean. We can try to reach some consensus. So there are all sorts of contexts where I might indeed have trouble understanding what somebody else means. I might, for example, read Wittgenstein's Philosophical Investigations for the first time and think, I have no idea what's happening here. Um, these guys are working on a construction project and saying slab in various contexts. Says, oh, what? what's this about? I don't know. And so I may feel like I don't understand, but what happens? Well, I don't have to just say, I don't understand what Wittgenstein signs up to and toss the book aside. Instead, I can say, hmm, okay, uh, now Wittgenstein is now gone, but people at the time could ask Wittgenstein what he meant. They could engage in dialogue with him. Other people can interpret the work, then they can discuss these interpretations. And so even once an author like Wittgenstein or Shakespeare or whoever it is is gone, we have ways of trying to improve our understandings of their texts, of their behavior. And so look at what historians do when they look at various historical figures and they try to interpret their actions, understand what they saw themselves as doing. That requires a kind of effort, and yes, we may never know that we've succeeded fully. On the other hand, we can get better and better at this. We can find out more facts. We can find ways of getting an insight into what they intended, how they were seeing things. And so Gadamer says, look, in an ordinary context, it's even easier. I can ask you what you mean if I don't understand. I can ask you if I'm understanding it. I say, look, am I understanding you right? You're saying this? And find out what you say in response. I can, in various ways, try to improve my understanding of what you mean by listening to you, by hearing other people react to what you've said and say, oh, that's, that's how I'm supposed to interpret it. Okay. Maybe in that way we can actually reach some kind of common understanding and some consensus about what we each mean. Well, Derrida doubts that such a consensus is possible. And Gadamer admits, look, it might not always be possible. Maybe there are some people who have such a foreign view from my point of view that I can't understand them. Maybe there are cases where it's like, I'm sorry, I just can't make any sense of this. I don't understand what you're up to. I don't understand what you mean. But Gadamer sees it not only as an ideal, but something that most often we can achieve. And in fact, he said, we do achieve it. Suppose some friends are trying to decide where to go for dinner. It's not as if they'll just never understand each other. That's ridiculous. This happened just last evening. I spent the entire day over at my daughter's house. We were working on a Ford F-150 truck. I had on my Miata. Uh, succeeded with the Miata, not quite with the truck, but spent, I guess, about four and a half hours outside on a 105 degree afternoon um, working mostly under these automobiles, and it was kind of exhausting, so afterwards we thought, well, let's reward ourselves and get some dinner, but where do we go? Well, 
there were various proposals. But we understood each other's proposals. Somebody said, what about Pecan Street Cafe? I looked up and said, oh, they're closed. What about 54th Street? Oh, they have these things on the menu? How interesting. What about this place? Oh, I haven't been there. Tell me about it. What about that place? Oh, well, we could do that. And so on and so forth. We understood the places that the other people were talking about. If we didn't, we looked them up or we said, oh, tell me about it. And in some cases, yes, it was hard to understand. Actually, I had never been to 54th Street before. I didn't really know what it was going to be like. The descriptions didn't convey much meaning to me. But then I got there and looked around. Said, okay, I get it. Yes, it's kind of like this or kind of like that. All of a sudden, like, yes, I actually was able to experience it. Now, notice here, there's something interesting, I think, that Gadamer can point to, which is we not only ask each other, that is to say, the way to go about trying to improve our understanding of a dialogue is not always just to engage in further dialogue, it's also to engage in further experiences. I may not really get what this restaurant is like until we go there. And then I look around and I look at the full menu and say, oh, I, I get it now, I see what this is. And so I think there are a lot of times when that happens. The increased experience is sometimes not mediated through language. It is, we're directed to it through language, but then we look, and we look at the thing in the world. Now that requires interpreting, of course, the thing in the world as well as language. But I think Derrida's idea, underlying his skepticism here, is that there's no real difference between interpreting language and interpreting things in the world. Interpreting the view of the restaurant or its menu and so on. Whereas I think Gadamer would say, look, it's not always the same thing. The problem of interpretation of hermeneutics is not uniform. It's not uniformly something that can succeed, as some hermeneuticists have thought, but neither is it something that is hopeless. Instead, we have to look at this given context, and sometimes there are experiences, like, hey, going to the restaurant, that actually help immensely in our understanding. So, we cannot, Gadamer would say, be universally skeptical, but neither can we be universally optimistic. Maybe sometimes we can agree on certain norms and we can actually understand what somebody else means. Maybe some other times we can't. It's going to depend on the context, on the participants, on the way the dialogue itself and our experiences that are relevant to the dialogue proceed.